Okay. Everybody can see it? Yep. Okay. Perfect. So my capstone project is based off of the Black Lives Matter movement that started police reform in Rochester. And unbeknownst to me, oh, can we not? Hold on, there we go. Um, the police reform actually started in the 1970s. It started with a girl named Denise Hawkins, who unfortunately was killed. Her sister had called police and said she's fighting with her husband. They always get very violent. I'm afraid there's something wrong. Police came over and a young police officer of 22 age was a rookie. Denise came out of the house with a knife, didn't stop and ask, shot a bullet through her chest. This uproared the community at that time because it was a young black woman at that time who had been shot by a white cop and they did not agree with the circumstances. So let me just move this. Again, you can see my own slides. Hey, you can go on the bottom, didn't know that. Um, a committee was started, it was called the Citizens Committee. They dubbed it the Crimmy Committee after a local lawyer named Charles um, Crimmy. So they dubbed it after him. Um, and it was started to create e efforts in reforming police in Rochester. They made about 97 recommendations, 85 were approved and one of the recommendations that they started with in the 70s was that officers need to have education on what they're doing. You cannot just hire an officer without educational purposes. They should have at least something more than an equivalent of a high school diploma. They need to go to college, essentially. Um, they also liked to enforce the idea that police officers at the time were to live in the city that they policed. They gave them great background on who they were working with, the neighborhood communities, making connections of all different ethnicity groups. That was one of the, the ground rules that they wanted as improvements in the 70s. Um, and they also wanted psychological testing done on police officers at that time as well. Moving on from that, they had a RASE committee created and the purpose of this committee was, it was initially created by an executive order in the 19, 1946, and it was to investigate uh, civil rights in the country and to strengthen those rights. Um, then within all of the Black Lives Matter movement that has recently come up within a year, New York and Rochester created their own race commission. They call it the race commission instead of the committee. This was created in August of 2020. It's a slightly different um, word jargon if you look at it versus the first initial one that came out was investigating criminal rights in the country or civil rights in the country and proposing methods to strengthen them. If you look at the words that are now used now, it's a, the laws apply to a fair application of citizens, um, protecting those citizens and not allowing people to get away with certain crimes against racial violence. We move on from that. Has there been any improvement in the last 44 years? Uh, like I said, there was 97 changes that were recommended by the Crimi Committee in the 70s. 85 were approved. Not a whole lot of improvement happened in 44 years, unfortunately. Um, on the initial start of the 1970s, there was about 28.5 minority officers living or being officers in RPD area, it's been reduced to about 13% now, um, which is obviously a big decrease in 2020. Um, and remember how I said that one of their recommendations was to have police officers live in the city that they policed, less than 15% of those police officers that live and work in the city actually live there as well. Um, the facet, which is a family oriented, it's a social services for health in that community, in our community of Rochester, was supposed to have a recommendation of being essentially broader. It was supposed to gain a lot more people to help, you know, create a much more balanced community, 
they would be answering uh, service calls for RPD instead of RPD going there. They would be helping with mental health cases instead of RPD. And they gained two more social workers over 44 years. Two. Instead of, they were supposed to have about 50. They're much more than 10. They started with eight, they got two. Um, and they get about 3,500 calls a year. Last year, that's about, or two years ago, that's about what they got. And about 30,000 30, of them are RP service calls. Not the police needed to go to that scene. They needed somebody with social services help to go to the scene, but police were called instead. And if we move on from that, how this pertains to Black Lives Matters, if you've just overviewed what I've showed you, and there's much more in depth than that, you can see why people are frustrated still especially people of color, there's no, there's no movement, there's no improvement. Um, people of their friends and families that they call police to help are getting killed. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement started as a hashtag in 2013 by three women. And it was released, it was created after the death of Trayvon Martin, who was shot by a cop. Um, and he was only 17 years old. So one of the quotes that the woman stated, um, Garza was that the Black Lives Matter after seven years is now really in the DNA and muscle memory of this country. It's a movement that has been moving forward for quite some time, again, started in 2013, but it has even started before then in Rochester. So we move on from that. You can see a picture of George Floyd. You can see a picture of Breonna Taylor, and you can see a picture of Daniel Prude. Daniel Prude is our unfortunate um, Rochester, New York person of color that we lost due to a mental health case that was not evaluated correctly by police. Um, there was an organization I found that has no connection with the police. They just map based off of the data that they see. And they had mapped that from the years of 2013 to 2019, New York, in New York, police killed about 71 black people and 53 white people. That black people were more than five times more likely to be killed by police than white. Um, and based on you know the two million 911 calls in two cities, it concluded that any white officer that was dispatched to a black neighborhood fired their guns five times as often rather than a black person who went to a neighborhood of their similar characteristics, they were not likely to fire. We move on from that. The current suggested police reform that I have found is when everybody hears the words defund police, they think, oh, we don't have a police force anymore. How can you defund police? We need police officers to patrol the streets. There's no police officers. It's not, we're not eradicating them completely. We're taking the precautions and the measurements that we use to enforce police, and we're taking those essential characteristics and essential needs and wants, and we're moving them to places of more need. Downsizing the police force means we're taking all those resources and we're putting them into social services. We're giving them to people who go, hey, this is a mental health crisis call. Take care of this. We do not need police. They do not have a weapon. They are sick. They have just come out of the hospital. We do not po need police to restrain them. We need a mental health caretaker to figure out what's wrong. We need a therapist on standby to figure out, okay, what's the caseload of this person? How can we help? That's what it means to essentially make the police force smaller. We're gonna taking resources from police. Right now, RPD has 700 police officers. couldn't even find the number on how many social workers we have in this area that are just stretched so thin because we do not have enough people in social care to care for people with mental health. Um, there was another um, suggested reform of reconstructing the police Lotus Club. A lot more of this has to do with rules, which we'll get into in a later slide on how they take care of people when they arrest them. Uh, do not use pepper spray on certain people how you take care of juveniles. If a juvenile is having a family crisis, they're allowed to have their parent with them if the parent's not the issue. They're allowed to have certain rights 
that police can't just take a nine-year-old, throw them in the back of a car and say, all right, you stay put. That's not how you take care of people who are under 16 or 14 years old. Um, there's also, that's more of the reconstruction for the Police Lotus Club. And there's been a lot of controversy back and forth between Rochester trying to figure out uh, what's too much um, control being taken away and what's enough that they still feel like they can help with their own local police. Um, this is some of the research that I found on RPD's revised policies. Uh, juvenile treatment um, was members are prohibited from using chemical agents. This was specifically after a nine-year-old girl got pepper sprayed. Um, and this was directly what is connected to that. You can't use pepper spray on juveniles. You can't. It's, it's a girl that's 90 pounds versus an officer that's 200 pounds. You don't need to use pepper spray on a little girl. I mean, I can pick up a little girl. I, I don't need to use pepper spray. Um, there was another one that this is directly, I believe, tied to Daniel Prude, which is the restrictions of body weight. Um, and it specifically says how you can restrain somebody without um, pressing on them. This is also can be tied to George Floyd as well. Um, not cause them to have asphyxiation because Daniel Prude had died from asphyxiation. The medical examiner stated that that's how he died was asphyxiation from force. Um, not what the police said that he died because he had an overdose of PCPC in his system um, that it was mostly due to the fact that they were pushing on a part of his neck or essentially withholding him that he should not have been withhold while he was already sick, while he was already deranged and that caused him to die. Um, and in, I don't know if anybody knows this story, but this also is very similar to Denise Hawkins, who his brother had called. My her brother's not feeling well. He just came out of the mental hospital. Can you please help? And the police ended up accidentally killing him. So there was a few laws I found that were created after these certain Brianna Taylor had died and Daniel Prude had died that I found to be um, very useful and very interesting. Um, Daniel's law is not an actual law yet. From what I can um, see, it's basically, it's still in the process of becoming a law. Um, there's a lot of holdup with our economy right now with things going on. So it's been a little stagnant, but it hopefully will become a law. And it's essentially allowing mental health response units to help those who need help with mental health issues, not police officers, or at least to be with a police officer in case they do need the police officer, but the mental health agencies can go, no, they're fine, they're sick, they're not gonna resist, we're just gonna take them back to the hospital. Um, Brianna's law is more important for, in Kentucky, that it prohibits laws from uh, no-knock warrants entering your home. So the reason why she unfortunately died was her boyfriend, did not hear the police identify who they were because they suspected that there was something wrong in the house. They barged through the house. He fired because he didn't hear them say they were police. And it, through the entanglement, they ended up killing Brianna. Um, and there also was a, a statement of identification of police, not just verbally, but more with their uniforms. They need to be more colored so that people can easily go, that's a police uniform, um, especially at nighttime when you got dark blue shirts, you can't really identify a police officer. Um, and more detailed warrants to state, this is the house we have to go to, what is the make of the house, what are the cars that are in front of the house, not just, it's along the street, you know, hopefully it's somewhere around there. So to hopefully prevent this again. Um, and then I ended with where is Rochester now? Um, like I said, it's a very confusing field right now. I tried to do a lot of research on exactly where people were on Rochester. Um, it's hard to say because there's still a lot of things have been put on hold, which is normal, unfortunately, for this type of reform. There's a lot of holds, there's a lot of going back and forth, there's a lot of you know, the mayor stating if RPD doesn't come up with a radical change, they're completely dismantling the police force. Um, there's a lot of people would like to see that 
the um, power of being able to put police in a perspective and be able to fire them immediately if they do something that is against their training or against their um, duty as a police officer is given to somebody who actually has the ability to use it correctly, such as the police um, union contract. They would like to take that power away and they would like to give it to, you know, a diff they're essentially restructuring, recreating and creating new policies with new people in power essentially to eradicate mu much of the racial discrimination that has gone on in police offices. Um, and they're still consistent with trying to downsize and restructure the task force of RPD. Like I said, they have 700 officers that they would like to put in different areas rather than just leaving them to have, you know, in the city. They believe that there's too many officers in the city um, that they need to be put outward more to different areas to get different socialized training. Um, and that's essentially what I've I found so far for my project. So, so Lindsay, um, thank you very much. I, I, I wonder if you can, I remember the Crimi, the Crimi Commission and, and those data that you cited uh, that there were, I think it was 28% minority uh, officers down to whatever it was, 13. And, um, and I remember that there was some push to have officers live in the, in the city. So why didn't that happen? I mean, why didn't that, why did both of those things, well, the, 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 the residency is one thing, but the, the decline in minor and the percentage of minority officers is startling. I, I did not know that. So can you talk about both of those things a little bit? I think that would have to do with one of the things we're taught in criminal justice is the zones of which people live. In the city, there's a bigger zone of, you know, minorities because it's, much cheaper housing versus out in the suburbs, Spencer Port, Penfield. You know, I think it's that there's the zones are changing a lot. And police officers, especially minority police officers, if there are if people of color or people of you know Hispanic um, ethnicities are already being treated poorly, the worst job you can have in some circumstances of being again treated poorly is a police officer. So Probably my guess would be there's not enough um, there's not enough trying on the police side of things saying hey we need more you know black police officers we need more ethnic police officers who speak Spanish to help us out sometimes they're just not trying enough and other times it's you know the people that are from the communities go I don't want to be shot at every day I don't want somebody to go you know make racist marks at me every day um, I think it has to do with essentially how RPD tries to really output, hey, we would like these kind of officers. A lot of the times what I saw when the policies suggested they did this and there was no catch 22 for the backing of getting that back was they kind of, they left it in the water. Well, we tried, you know, we put a little checkbox on the, on the, you know, saying, hey, would you like to be a minority officer? And that's about how much it comes up to. They don't, they don't really in-depthly talk or they don't have people that actually know ethnic groups and, you know, cultural differences to go, hey, how do we get people of minorities to be cops? You know, most of the time it's just people don't want, they don't want to be shot at, they don't want to be killed, they don't, you know, want to be stabbed every day or every other day. So, so... <laughs> this, this is a huge issue uh, and obviously even bigger than, than it's been in, in recent years in Rochester. I mean, the number of homicides is over 70 now. And, um, and you know, the, uh, the city, go city government and, uh, and, the, and the, religious, uh, the religious community is, is wondering what on earth to do with it. So, I mean, have, have you looked at it from the point of view of the sorts of, of uh, of criminality that's going on, and 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 particularly from the point of view of, of how many murders we're seeing. I mean, is, did that? I, I mean, you're you're in criminal justice, right? So, what does a criminal justice student think about that? About 
about about the rise in well specifically the the rise in uh, homicides i think it's i think it has to deal with people are tired of things not changing i think it has to deal with i personally think there there should be more criminal justice police officers for one thing there should be police officers who have a degree in criminology that are taught by our professors at RIT that go, look, here's all your data. I have a cousin who wants to be a police officer. He's not going to college though. I'm gonna slap a textbook in front of him and go, what do you know about the racial groups? What do you know about the difference between racial you know, profiling that you're taught in an academy and they are still working on changing and they say that they will change, but it hasn't changed in 44 years or a hundred years since police. So the issue goes all the way back from when police officers were first needed. At that time, Blacks were still segregated. Even before that, we didn't have a whole lot of people of ethnicities coming over. At first, it was the Irish we didn't agree with. Then we kind of got used to the Irish because they were, you know, white like us. This is from what I have learned from my criminal justice team. Yeah. Um, we kind of got used to that. So they, they were okay. Anybody European, we were okay with. But it initially started with we didn't like the Irish. Um, you know, we didn't like the Chinese. It's always anybody who has started in America belongs in America. Anybody who comes over from a different country doesn't belong here. And that has been the premise of the United States from the very get go of the Constitution. And it has not changed. And every single time there's another person in office, they try to change it and people go into an uproar. It's the same thing that has happened throughout history. Every once in a while, it gets slightly better. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think, is is a way that it's becoming, you can't get rid of it, I think, is the, the thing that's the best thing about it. You can't right. spin out it and, you know, push it aside and go, okay, well, that's done. In a way, I talked to a couple of my friends. They say that the media coverage is, is not as, like I said, it was there for about a year um, when the Black Lives Matter movement started to be really become a forefront. And like I said, I can't, I can't, there's no news articles really recent, like within a past couple months. I think the, the closest one I found was in March of 2021. Um, and that was the last that I found on police reform, but it really just goes back to, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding and there's not enough people with a criminal justice background who do not need guns to say, this is the reason why this person is doing this. This person has no money. The person turned to drugs because they lost half their family. How can we get them help off of drugs so they're not trying to rob houses, scaring the crap out of somebody, and then committing a homicide? There, it's not just one issue. It's an amount of societal change that adds to one another. It's a person, an individual person that once your life is turned up, then you have three more people whose lives are turned up, then you have four more, and it, it just adds, and then it creates an actual population of an issue. Okay. Well, thank you. This is obviously a very important subject, and it sounds like you've um, you've gone into the history of it. It's always important. In, in, it's all, if you want to understand the present, it's always important to to look back at the history. So I think you've done a nice job uh, on that in, in your project. Meg, would you like to ask a couple of questions? We, we, obviously, sure, we've, we've gone over the twenty minutes. In fact, we're yeah. twenty eight minutes. But as long as uh, as uh, the third student isn't here, then I guess we can keep going. Yeah, I'll I'll be brief because I I do think we want to keep everyone's um, presentations to about the same length. But um, so, um, Lindsay, I would say, um, you know, wow, what a complex topic. My question would be: Did you have the opportunity to interview anyone from? Um, the mayor's office from that's currently on the police force. Um, so I, I know you've gathered some historical context. Have you gotten um, any uh, first person perspectives on uh, how things stand? I have from a point of my criminal justice teachers who are part of the Black Lives Matter movement. I have uh, Nick Robertson, who's one of my crim professors, and then Joe Williams, who's another one. Nick's much more, um, he's much more in tune with it. He's also on a couple committees in the local Arondequoit area of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, have, I haven't tried to go um, and get a police officer's perspective. 
I think that's a little hard. I think it depends on which way I'm coming from, because I think that it's even though it's been about a year and a lot less, um, a lot less intense, it still hits a couple people's nerves. So I would be a little hesitant to go up to a police officer and ask, um, especially in the RPD area, because one, they're probably not going to tell me anything. They're they're very, um, you know, you'll find out when you find out from the media. Um, well, this is where I think you would utilize, obviously, the contacts that you have. Uh, yeah, I can, I know Joe, Professor I know Williams William and... has a couple contacts that I can um, talk with briefly. I can ask him and see if I can, if he knows anybody in the RPD area. I do know there's, there's a um, sheriff's office, like, right down the street in Spencerport from me, <laughs> but I think it would be more beneficial to ask RPD themselves yeah. or somebody from yeah. RPD, but I've never thought of it. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, no, I thought that was a really interesting project. Thank you very much. Um, so Gabe, do you want to take over? Yeah, I can do that. Um, let me share my slides. One sec. Uh, okay, so can you see the slides? Yep. Our slide singular at this point? Um, okay. So uh, I've done my project on mental illness uh, being portrayed in role-playing games. Um, so yeah, specifically, okay, well, let me change slides. Uh, I looked a lot at D and D uh, for a few reasons. So actually, let me back up and just say that uh, for people who aren't as familiar, um, role playing games, tabletop role playing games are essentially a collaborative tabletop storytelling uh, type of game. You roll dice, you each inhabit a character. And you basically tell stories using some amount of game rules and some amount of creative storytelling and improv. Um, Dungeons and Dragons D and D is the first one that came out. It came out in the seventies and is still the most popular by a large margin. Uh, so that is the main reason I looked at D and D is just there's a, so many more people to play it than basically any other RPG. Um, I also uh, did look a fair bit at Call of Cthulhu because that's a a, a game system based on Lovecraft's writing, which is often about um, insanity and madness and stuff. So I think given that that is the type of portrayal you get in these games, which I'll get to, uh, it was worth looking at kind of one of the games that focuses on that aspect. And I looked at a few other games here and there as well. Um, so I uh, basically, my research actually started with uh, uh, academic sources, which on the exact subject I'm searching for, there wasn't a lot, but I did find some interesting things that basically like psychiatrists and psychologists tend to have a very negative perception of people who play these games, which isn't even what I was looking at, but it's interesting that, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot of times um, D and D players are seen as like antisocial or weird uh, by like, you know, psychiatrists uh, and psychologists so that if you were like a psychologist, a counselor treating someone, they told you you played D and they played D and D, it would be like you you know if you're the patient in that situation, you've got to hope it's not one of the doctors who thinks immediately makes judgments about you based on that. So I thought that was kind of interesting and definitely related to the rest of my project, but not directly. So I looked at like I said a few role playing games, including D and D. Um, I looked at early editions and the most recent. Um, I spoke with uh, Dr. Condry in the psychology department, um, and that was a very productive conversation. I talked to Dr. Uh, or I talked to Trent Hergenrader in the English department um, just recently, and I'm also planning to talk to Professor Hermson, Lisa Hermson, in English on Monday. Um, feel like getting the because uh, so Dr. Condry obviously has the knowledge about actual you know psychology and. Uh, Trent is someone who knows a lot about role-playing games in a different context than just, you know, playing for fun, you know, academic uses of these games and stuff. Um, another step I took was looking at the, um, uh, my peers in my role-playing groups. I'm kind of, I'd say in, a, in groups of about 15-ish people, maybe more like 12, uh, who I'm currently uh, or sometimes play with. And um, 
I informally did just asked a few of these people some questions anonymously and um, kind of got a feel for what what people play in these games who aren't really asking these questions, you know, for a capstone project or, you know, for general interest, like what they think about how mental health is portrayed in role playing games. Um, and then I went looking for um, ways that role playing games have done this well, which is why I have that picture of a book from the fate system uh, on this slide. I'll get to that a little later, but it was a good role playing game book that talks about mental illness in a mature and sensible way. Unlike um, basically all the popular ones, uh, like D&D, for example, this is an image I have from one of the recent D&D books, which I think captures the very like sensationalized portrayal that you see in um, Dungeons and Dragons and Call of Cthulhu and um, a lot of popular games. And it, it's, it's a mirror of what you see in, uh, you know, other media. Um, there are sensational depictions that there's reliance on harmful stereotypes that they're often extremely inaccurate and extremely harmful to people who actually have mental illness. Um, it is, at least in D&D and Call of Cthulhu, and I'm thinking most games that he choose to broach the subject, it, mental illness is generally just treated as like, sorry, a, a, a kind of debility to be inflicted on characters and either played around or overcome. But otherwise, it's strictly, it's just a penalty applied to characters to make it harder for you if you get a, a madness or an insanity, and that's generally the terms they use for it. Um, there are a lot of times in the games I looked at, uh, associations between causes of uh, illness, symptoms, and even in some cases, real world diagnoses such as schizophrenia or, you know, um, bipolar disorder or whatever, where they'll, they'll take like real world terms and diagnoses but then kind of make up symptoms that aren't realistic because, you know, it's, it's this, the sort of movie schizophrenia or, you know, they'll have um, characters who, when they get manic become super strong. And that's supposed to be part of just part of, you know, having a mania is that it makes you, you know, Hulk out or whatever. Um, there are a lot of situations in D and D where they, you can get driven insane by something supernatural like you know alien creatures or tomes of uh, magical book like magical books that contain knowledge not meant for humans to read and these things will give you like symptoms of real um mental illnesses or else will give you symptoms that sort of sound like it if you don't know anything about it which is even worse and then of course there's a, another common issue with found in other parts, other kinds of fiction where the villain will be generally mad or insane. And that's the explanation of why they do all the evil things they do. So all of this is pretty harmful. Um, and I wanted to look at what you can do about this. And this is where like my conversation with Dr. Condry was also helpful. Um, so like one thing um, that I think would benefit the, the gaming community, I guess, is um, just making all the things I just said known, like why, how and why the depictions in the official games are harmful. Um, and then if you're going to talk about mental illness in a game, don't just treat it like, uh, you know, sensationalized versions of the real thing uh, that just exist to make your character suffer. Uh, actually, you, you should do your research. You should not define a character by their illness. You know, um, just like another another thing that's not on the slide is talk to people you play with because sometimes someone in a group um, will actually have mental illness and not have disclosed it. But if it comes up in the game and it's handled poorly, it can be really distressing. Um, so these are all kind of things that I think the community, the role-playing community should really try to adopt uh and then in terms of my project and where i wanted to go with it i wanted to make an alternate system that kind of keeps the game aspect of madness in, in these games um but without the, the all the baggage of the real mental illness that it's sort of kind of trying to portray but not well 
Um, so I uh, am currently working on a uh, Dungeons and Dragons supplement, uh, just sort of like an extra rule you can add to your game um, uh, around supernatural corruption, which basically is going to, you know, it's intended to replace the madness rules with something that is fills the same niche in the game of, um, you know, something that something bad that can happen to your character as a result of exposure to supernatural um, mental, you know, mind warping dangers, um, but that doesn't have any direct relation to mental illness. Um, so I, I obviously have to consider everything I've already said about what, not you know, not making the same mistakes that are in, in the games already. Um, and, you know, if I want to do, you know, if I want to create this this corruption system, I the goal is to not portray mental health um, and let people do that themselves and do their own research and decide if they want that to be part of their game. Then I need to make sure that the like effects of the corruption that I put into my game system are not actual symptoms or reminiscent of actual symptoms. So that's kind of where. I want to show it to um, some of my peers in my RPG groups, possibly also run it by Dr. Condry again, um, if I have time. And uh, eventually the goal is to basically have a document, which I've already, I've already done a good chunk of the writing for this. Um, the goal is to have a document of a, sum a quick summary of basically here's what here's the problems I've outlined about how mental illness is portrayed uh, in role playing games and why you should care and how you might want to actually handle mental illness. And here is a way to replace the rules they have for mental health and madness um, with something that fills the same role in the mechanics of the game without, you know, uh, the, the baggage, like I mentioned. So uh, I'm going to be finishing this document uh, this semester and putting it up on dmsguild.com, which is a website where you can basically like publish and sell uh, like like supplementary content for D and D, um, and you're allowed to you know use the uh, the copyrighted copyright copyrighted material and all that as long as you post it there. So. Uh, the goal is probably just put it as pay what you want because I'm doing this for a project and not to make money, but to get it out there also, like, I, I'd like that considering one of my points of how to make this situation better is generally raise awareness in the community of the people playing these games, um, that I'd like to put my thoughts, um, which I think are pretty well researched at this point, out for people to look at, and I think also coupling it with the corruption system uh, will help kind of get it to people who look at, look for products on DM skill because it's sort of more a gamey aspect that ties into the subject. Um, yeah, uh, I think that is about all I had. Um, I mentioned on the slide there's a stress rule that I was also thinking of adding. Um, I think I'm not going to design a system for this, but I'll probably mention it in my corruption um, rule thing because... Um, the stress mechanic is when I was looking at other role playing games, the handle was better. There's a few games that have sort of generalized like stress uh, or fatigue mechanics, uh, where you know, um, if your character is in all these horrible situations where monsters are attacking you or whatever, then they get stressed out and that can affect them. And it's more of a general thing as opposed to saying this character, you know, this character has PTSD or has schizophrenia. Um, and trying to represent something that complex in the rules of a game. Uh, I think I the main reason I'm opting not to do a mechanic system for stress is I'm focusing on D&D. D&D is a game where the characters are heroes who do a lot of you know violence against monsters, and it's kind of just the main part of the game. So it doesn't really make sense to include something like that. The stress mechanic that I liked the best was in the Alien RPG, which is very different because it's a horror game where you're basically playing ordinary people put in the path of a dangerous monster. 
And in that game, it makes more sense. But in D&D, it's sort of, you know, very high fantasy heroics. So I think while it's a useful tool for other systems, I'm focusing on a game where it doesn't make as much sense. But the corruption one, I'm um, definitely going to finish and put up on DM's code. Um, yeah, that is pretty much it uh, in terms of my slides. Thanks, Gabe. So um, I'm wondering, I have, I have two questions. First of all, I'm, I'm wondering what the peer group or, or the, 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 the respondents that, that, that you engage with to talk about your, your points here, whether they recognize the issue themselves um, whether they agreed with you that it is an issue? I mean, how did those conversations go? It, uh, in, in these, I basically just gave them questions to answer, so it wasn't much of a back and forth because I wanted to make sure people could do it anonymously. But it's interesting in that there was a lot of like agreement that it's an issue, but then people weren't really sure how to articulate why it was an issue in a lot of cases, which really just kind of backs up my point that people need to talk about this and, and be mindful yeah. of the issue and learn about it a little bit. Um, because I think a lot of people were generally like, yeah, there's something up here. This is rubs me the wrong way. But then only I'd say only one of the five or six people I interviewed could really articulate what bothered them about it um, in good detail. So, yeah. OK. Um, the other the other question I have is uh, whether you know something you said at the beginning was interesting that psychologists and psychiatrists think that people who play DD mm -hmm. and other games like it are uh, are a little bit a little bit suspicious of, uh, of 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 them. So can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, since my yeah. son plays it, still plays it, and he's in his forties now, <laughs> I'm interested mm -hmm. in in why psychiatrists would think that. I think, so that's interesting because it kind of loops back to a couple of things. So for one thing, the media portrayal aspect, like just as um, in general media, mental illness is generally portrayed inaccurately. D&D uh, &D is always, when it shows up in media, it's always social outcasts playing it. And often they're the butt of jokes. Um, and this is changing with, um, you know, uh, D and D has gotten very popular with kind of my generation, uh, thanks to certain online, you know, uh, people streaming their games and like making a big show of performance out of it, uh, and that's sort of slowly altering the public perception. But up to that, up to very recently, it's you know, D and D has been around a long time, and there's always been a stereotype of you know people playing in their mother's basements or whatever, and that really did you know, it started out that way undeniably um i don't i don't think you can generalize that but still i mean it, it, it's an interesting public perception i, I mean i'm I, i'm not altogether innocent of that but mm -hmm. when, when i when i think about it i think well why would i think that i mean there's nothing wrong with playing in the basement <laughs> right i i don't know i think it's such a weird thing to that this is sort of getting off of my main topic but you know that Nerd, being a nerd isn't really a bad thing the way it used to be when, like by the time I was a teenager most of the stigma around you know sci-fi and D&D &D and all these things that what well, was actually like stigmatized to some extent when like my dad was a kid is now you know almost I've almost never been like judged by peers for playing D&D uh, &D. like if I mention it offhand I don't get comments like that yeah, but yeah. I, I think you you definitely would have more if you, if you go look backward more. Yeah, yeah, very interesting and and a, and a very unique uh, a very unique topic. I, and certainly nobody has talked about this before in in, in the context of these capstones. So thanks very much. Very interesting, mm -hmm. Meg. Hi, Gabe. Really nice job. Um, so I've got a couple questions. Um, the first one is kind of a springboard off of what Stephen asked, and that is, were you able to find, I mean, so d and I know has been around for a while, um, but were you able to find um, any research other than the anecdotal interviewing and conversation with psychiatrists, psychologists, 
um, were you able to find any actual, you know, um, physical research on this topic? Um, um, not like through mental illness. Not through like the RIT the databases you can get through the RIT library. And I think this is something that I've talked to Trent about, Trent Hergenrader, like I mentioned, where there's just some long-standing resistance to acknowledge role-playing games and games in general in like an academic sense. Even video games, I mean, have taken a long time to be seen by like the academic community as like worthy of any amount of academic discussion. So I think I found, I did find, I think the closest thing I found was one article about um, a patient, a psychiatric patient who had severe depression and autism and who was a big fan of D&D. And basically this was like a case study of that person's psychiatrist uh, using the, the, the patient's uh, fondness for D&D to kind of help them through some of their problems and kind of, you know, use D&D therapeutically, which is, a, is something that definitely interests me, not exactly the topic of the project, but um, and even that I really only found one source like it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. I'm sure that there is some resistance, um, which I am in agreement with you. I think that there are actually quite a number of applications for a game like this for, mm -hmm. Um, for the therapy of a variety of different kinds. Um, we actually had a student about, it's probably been about three or four years ago um, that did a game that actually measured, um, that did kind of some research behind a game that he built that actually measured in a really tangible way um, individuals' empathy by the mm. choices that they made. And the game had a lot of, had a decision-making tree. So based on the decisions that you made, you could measure someone's empathy. So I, I think in a similar way, it would be interesting to, um, just to think about the way in which we negatively perceive mental illness. My mm. question for you about D&D in particular is, do you think that it has maintained it's been a while around for a while. I remember it um, there being a group of individuals in high when I was in high school that were huge D and D fans. Um, I'll say they probably were the brain trust of our high school, um, smartest kids. Um, but my question is, do you think because it's been around so long, it just hasn't moved along with the times, and so therefore? The, the negative perception or portrayal of mental illness is just kind of ingrained? Yeah, I think, so actually I have another point about the um, use of games in um, in therapeutic context, which I want to get back to that I just remember. But to answer that question, yeah. yes. Um, I think the, the issue is that, you know, the game has been around what, like 50, no, 45 years-ish, and uh, the people who started playing it were a lot of times like the people who played it when it first came out a lot of times were you know because the people who made the game undeniably had some hang-ups on race and sex and whatever in terms of you know biases that were pretty bad um and there's there are things that the, a lot of the community a growing part of the community has been wanting to change have the company who makes it change for a long time the issue is that a lot of the people who've been in the game since the very beginning are still playing and are still very vocal about wanting to keep, you know, keep things how they were in the good old days. Uh, even though that means stuff like, you know, certain playable humanoid species being inherently stupider and more like tribal than uh, humans or whatever, where it's very, you know, there's a lot of really iffy stuff in the game and they've gotten a little bit better about some of it, but because so many of the people who've been there since the beginning are still playing and still vocal, it's hard to move past it. And then the um, the other thing I remembered about RPGs and therapy is there's actually a program you can do online um, uh, as a counselor where you can, they have like a, I think an eight week course or something on how to use role-playing games in therapy effectively. And there's like a certificate they give and everything. So um, I, I, I found their website. I have not delved past that, but it's interesting that, you know, RPGs are really growing and I think they're growing into a different space than the, like, the geek in the mother's basement archetype that, like, 
you sure. know, a lot of a lot of people in my generation who like D&D are not fitting that stereotype and they are more likely to want to do stuff like counseling. And there's like a niche that is already starting to be filled there. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. You know, just given the popularity of um, gaming and all the different types, um, you know, I, I would hope that we would move past some of those stereotypes and to to adopt what you're talking about in a, an acceptable way of operating. Um, and that's what it seems like you're interested in putting forward is an mm-hmm. assumption that people would make about how you operate in these games. Sorry, what was the last thing you said? Oh, I was saying that that's to me what it sounds like you are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which I, I really encourage is, is basically that people adopt a way in which um, they're going to operate in these communities, um, mm-hmm. which I think is a great recommendation. So really nice job. Um, Lindsay, Thank did you. you have a question? I thought I saw your hand up. I don't know if like, we're allowed to like pipe in, but from what I've done in my criminal justice research, a lot of game stereotypes, especially the RPG that you're talking about, a lot of them are connected to high school shootings. They use that. That's why I think maybe they might have, if you wanted to look into it just as a background more, um, they use that there's some kid who, you know, with antisocial played a lot of video games and he's the reason why there was a school shooting. That's part of the reason I think maybe they get the bad stigma of, you know, the basement, you know, sitting in the basement being antisocial, playing video games. Um, I know there's no actual research that shows I did I think, look it up, that there's no actual research that shows that video games are violent. But from what I've seen from um, school shootings, they do use that as a technical term. Well, he played a lot of video games. He wasn't really friendly, didn't have a lot of friends, and they kind of connect that and give it a horrible stigma, from what I know, at least. Yeah, I've heard that more with video games. I don't know if I've heard of role-playing games being connected to school shootings, but either way, it's like, yeah, it's like, you said there's not actually any research to back that up about video games either. No, it's, it's just one person did. hey, this person has, you know, as again, it goes with profiling. They try mm-hmm. to profile people and they pick out that the fact that they play video games and they don't have a lot of friends and they use it as a bad, you know, connection. And they, you know, people look for literally any excuse not to look at gun control. They would rather mm-hmm. blame anything mm-hmm. else they can than the fact that the access just to guns is there. Just in case you wanted to, you know, that's just what I've heard of it when you started your project. That's immediately why I was like, hey, I think I remember talking about that with mass shootings. Um, Well, really nice projects, um, really nice jobs. Stephen, anything else you wanted to add? No, I I, I just want to agree with what Gabe Gabe just said. You know, people will look for anything other than the obvious thing, which is gun control. (laughs) It's insane, just insane. All right. Well, that's beside the point as far as the uh, capstone course is concerned. So um, thank you very much, both. Nice job. And, um, and Meg will now tell you that you need to write two, essay, two papers, right, Meg? Yes, don't forget. <laughs> that's what she does. <laughs> <laughs> you have two papers to write, a reflection and a product paper. They both can go in the same Dropbox. And then just a reminder that we have the capstone symposium that we're still planning for on December 2nd. Um, and just best of luck as you wrap everything up. Um, really enjoyed your presentations. And, and if you are graduating, I hope you'll stay in touch with us and let us know the, the great things that you're up to. But really nice job. And thank you, Michelle, for being here. Thanks, thanks thank Michelle. You. Great job, guys. I enjoyed them. Thank you. Still I was just gonna ask, oh, go on. Go on. Uh, I was just going to ask with the um, symposium, do we need our, when do we need our poster in by? Well, I think it's in my courses. I don't want to, I believe it's the 24th, but I don't want to okay. see an incorrect date without having it pulled up right now. I, if it's on my courses, I could find it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's on, it's on my courses. Um, yeah. All right. I'll, I'll find it. It's fine. Have everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye guys. Maggie, you going to stay on so we can talk? Yeah. Okay. I, can't, I can't stay on for more than a few minutes, unfortunately. Okay. We can talk later tonight if you like. Okay. Yeah. Do that? All right. Wait, All right. Uh, hold on one second.